Hello world, it's Birdo Prey 5 Cupflaw, and welcome to my review of Star Trek Lower Deck Season 2, Episode 2, Kayshawn, His Eyes Open. And uh, yes, this is the episode that brings back the Tamarians, the, uh, the species from the famous TNG episode Darmok, where Picard gets beamed down to an alien planet uh, with a, another species who can only communicate in metaphors, uh, you know, Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra, uh, and so and such. And so, uh, yes, the first Tamarian has entered Starfleet, and he's seen in this episode, and we'll get to that in just a minute. The opening stinger is all about the uh, sonic showers so we get to see the communal showers of the cerritos and i'll be honest uh, that was the biggest issue with uh biggest issue my biggest issue with this episode was the fact that they had communal showers i honestly doubt a starship i know they have communal bedding i just uh, this this scene was more out of starship troopers than anything i could really believe in trek that said uh there was no nudity everything nothing was blurred they just didn't draw anything they didn't need to draw uh there says it was only a tvv uh rated show they there was no hard cursing uh there was no uh there were no sexual scenes or suggestions uh, I think the worst word spoken was hell. Uh, I think they purposely kind of made it a little bit more family friendly. And if they did do that uh, in response to people like me, excellent. Um, and if they didn't, then we just got lucky. Um, so the first, the opening stinger is uh, basically just that the guy Jet, who we saw last season... He's being he's coming in to replace Boimler. I don't know why it took three months for them to replace Boimler, but he's replacing Boimler on the lower decks uh, beta team. And um, so him and Mariner are both uh, alphas. Uh, both always want to be in charge, and that sets up the dynamics for this entire episode. Uh, the main part of the episode uh, is basically. They're going to the ship of a collector, uh, a collector who is, and apparently there's an entire collector's guild. So we're going to go to on a ship of somebody who's collected strange artifacts uh, all throughout Trek history. And um, they've got to say, find any things that's dangerous and, you know, take them off the ship and just leave the actually safe uh, collection to this guy who's got to uh, uh, auction them off. What I want to tell you is that I've always said I will give credit where credit is due. And this episode, episode two of season two, Kayshawn, uh, his eyes open, deserves credit. Okay, not only does it deserve credit, this is, in my opinion, the best episode of Star Trek Lower Decks. Nay, the best episode of any Star Trek we have seen since Enterprise. And that includes season episode 10 of last season, uh, which was previously the best episode of Star Trek we have seen since Enterprise. This episode eclipses season 10, uh, season one, episode 10, and surpasses it. Uh, we get a balanced amount of Boimler on the Titan, as well as the Cerritos, as well as Mariner, Rutherford, Tendi, and Jet, uh, in this case, for this episode. I'm trying to do this as spoiler-free as possible in the beginning here. 
So forgive me if I don't go detail by detail, uh, because you should watch this one. Okay, I don't care how you do it. If you've got your friend's account, uh, whatever, if you pay, if you want to get your free month, now may be a good chance to use your free month or whatever, whatever free uh, Paramount Plus offers uh, or however it is in your country. If it's on Amazon, whatever you've got, whatever you need to use to watch it, uh, you should. This this one, it is funny. The jokes are 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 well written. I want to say in true uh, Darmok and Jalad fashion, Cerritos when the jokes landed. Okay, that's the best. That's the best I could say for this. Cerritos when the jokes landed, and you would know I meant uh, season two, episode two. Um, They're not just member berries. Uh, there are uh, a lot of there's there are scenes you're gonna have to pause and look for the details, and that's half the fun of this show. Uh, is looking like I, I will I'm not gonna spoil it, but if you keep your eyes peeled, you will see uh, a, a couple of cases of Chateau Picard wine. Uh, they're they're in there. Um, I completely love uh, they they bring in a new piece of Klingon history, uh, Klingon relic uh, that we have not heard of before, uh, but it perfectly goes in with what we know about Klingons, and I, I I fell in love with it immediately as soon as I heard heard it. Um, it's uh, and mo most importantly. And this is a bit of a spoiler, but I think we all knew this was going to happen. Uh, at the end of this episode, Boimler does return to the Cerritos, but, but, Boimler returns to the Cerritos in a way that I 100% respect, and he loses zero of his earned uh, cred. Uh, there is no insult to him. There is no, uh, you know, Mariner doesn't doesn't trick him into doing something stupid. Boimler returns to the Cerritos, his eyes open. Uh, and it is respectable. And I can, going forward, because uh, this was my biggest problem. And this is what I, from last season... I said if they bring Boimler back and he's in, in, in it is some type of insult or some type of mockery, uh, he or we, we lose respect for the character of Boimler, then I will never be able to give this series a positive review again. But I have to say, Mike McMahon and his team, I didn't think they'd be able to do it, but... I was wrong. They did it. Okay? And I am happy, happy to be proven wrong. And, you know, I, 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 I'll be honest. Yesterday, I was making the thumbnail for this video early. And, like, I half, I half thought about putting on a thumbs down. And I, I, I actually did put on my angry face onto the thumbnail, assuming it was going to be a negative review. Uh, because, let's face it, uh, eight of the last uh, 10 episodes, 11 episodes, nine, nine of the last 11 episodes have been negative reviews. Uh, so, I was just playing the odds. Well, guess what? I'm happy to say I'm going to have to change that thumbnail before I put it out today uh, because I've got to go to my happy face. Uh, this, this, this is one of those cases. Happy to be wrong. Now, I don't know what next week's going to bring. Uh, we'll see next week. If next week is shit again, I will be there to tell you that. But this week, this episode, if you are a true 
Star Trek fan, if you've watched every episode from TOS through Enterprise and you you beat your head and you 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 found your way through watching Discovery, although you don't know why, and then you you took the plunge and you hoped for the best that you were going to jump into Star Trek Picard and it was going to be a swimming pool full of cool, clear, crisp water, and instead you realized too late you were diving into the shallow end of a bucket filled with poop, and you landed head first. I'm sorry. Uh, but this, this still remains to be seen. Uh, lower decks. I know it's not been everybody's cup of tea, but indications are getting better. They're getting better. Um, so, with that said, spoiler alert. The spoilers start now. Not counting, you know, what you've been might be watching over here. Um, okay, so. Uh, the Temerian is the new security chief. He replaces uh, Lieutenant uh, Sachs, the Bajoran who died last season. Uh, and so uh, uh, Captain Freeman uh, was getting her evaluation from Starfleet done. And so she's like, well, uh, she's got, she finds out that uh, she's being accused of micromanaging. So she says, no, you know what? She's going to give this mission to the new Temerian. He's a capable officer, and she's just going to let him do it his way, and she's not going to interfere. Uh, so the new officer, of course, is Kayshawn, uh, and he comes on, and the first thing he says when he steps under the bridge is... Um, at Kayshawn, his eyes open, and everybody like looks at each other like, what the what we, fuck are we supposed to do with this? Uh, we can't communicate. And then he coughs, and then he says, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, you know, the translator is still having a few issues with my language. And then we find out he can speak English just fine. Uh, it's only uh, as needed in the, in the plot where he'll, he'll say a phrase that doesn't translate. Uh, and to be honest, they do it and it works well. Uh, it's not something that's new to track. I mean, like they've had universal translators uh, since the beginning. And yet in many, uh, especially the Star Trek movies uh, and TNG, when the Klingons want to say something in Klingon, like Kapla, it doesn't translate. They They know, somehow they know when it should hear it in Klingon, and when you should hear it in English. So the same thing's happening in Temerian. Uh, you know, when when it's the most useful, it comes out in Temerian, and when it needs to, it comes out in English, uh, or Federation Standard, as as they call it. Um, so as I, as I told you earlier, his mission is to to go over, and he takes the lower decks crew which is now Mariner, Tendi, Rutherford, and the guy Jet. Uh, the he's he was he's the big black guy. Uh, you know he 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 was he was the one that made Boimler look like this little insecure, nothing of a dude. But actually, Jet turns out to have a, a personality uh, that's a lot more by the book than Mariner, and he actually comes off. A lot like Boimler, just with way more confidence. So Jet and Mariner are constantly uh, butting heads over who's in charge of the group. Because Jet feels like he's the natural leader, while Mariner says, no, she's the leader. And Tendi and Rutherford uh, are both happy to play uh, second fiddle to whoever wants to take charge. Neither of them are going to step up. Uh, until the end, and um, so uh, so we got uh, Kason goes over with the four lower decks people. 
and they've got to catalog this giant ship. The ship is just full of relics, and they think they're done, and that they, they just got to one room. Uh, and of course, the guy who's in charge is uh, also a collector, which means he's you know he's he's not 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 the most honest person in the world, and he doesn't trust Starfleet, uh, and Starfleet shouldn't trust him. Anyway, it turns out the ship was booby trapped by the collector who previously owned the ship. Uh, he said, if you moved something of mine, it means if you see this, it means I'm dead. And as punishment, uh, I'm going to turn you into part of my collection. And so this beam shoots out at what you can't tell if he was aiming for Tendi, which is what I thought he was. But in reviewing, I think he was aiming for the other collector. Um, but um, being such a good security officer, uh, Kayshawn runs and jumps and pushes them both out of the way. So he gets hit with the beam. Anyway, the beam, long story short, turns him into a, a doll. And so now uh, both Jet and Mariner both make a run to pick up the doll before it gets crushed. And so now they're trying to get off the ship uh, with the other collector before they all get killed. And um, they, 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 they have to go through, um, you know, problem after problem, maybe five or six things before they finally get off the ship. Uh, Mariner and Jet are constantly... Uh, fighting over which way to go, who has the better plan, uh, and um, interspersed are cutscenes to Boimler uh, on the Titan with Riker, uh, a full bridge crew. Uh, we have a lot of we have a lot of characters on the Titan, and the Titan is a is basically been in battle. The Titan's main mission apparently is to fight the pack lids. The pack lids are the new big bad guys. Uh, they've got super powerful ships. Uh, and Boimler, while he doesn't love it, he is able to do, you know, he's able to keep up. Uh, barely, just barely. But like Riker tells Boimler to, uh, to go around and shoot them in the aft. And he's able to do it, although everybody else on the Titan is all like, battle hardened and they're ready for war and Boimler is the only one there who misses exploring. Boimler wanted to go, you know, Boimler says he, he, he joined Starfleet to be on the Enterprise D to do th those types of missions. Okay. He wanted to go to strange new worlds. I don't think he said it that way, but, uh, and, and, and do those types of things. Meanwhile, the crew of the Titan are all like uh, soldiers and they're, they, they are laughing. They're like, could you imagine how, how bored Riker, Captain Riker must have been when he served on the D, uh, you know, playing in string quartets and, and going on these, you know, dumb missions. And, and Boimler like, here's this. He's like, no, this is, that's what Starfleet was about. He's like, that's why I joined Starfleet. And uh, like I said, these are spoilers. So uh, eventually he actually does get uh, most of the crew he is with to admit that they didn't join Starfleet to become soldiers. One joined Fleet Starfleet to study Moss. Another joined Starfleet because they like to be beamed everywhere. Uh, and so they actually all end up thanking Boimler for uh, putting them back in touch for why they joined Starfleet. Um, meanwhile, um, Boimler goes down to a mining colony that the, uh, the Packlids have just taken over uh, because they're, they're mining, I think it's called Vibranium or something, uh, which is this... Uh, mineral that can be used to make basically big bombs. And um, so they realize the pack lids have to be working with somebody else. Uh, they don't know who yet. I think it's going to be the Borg. Uh, there was clues 
in the opening credits and LDG and I looked through them yesterday. And yes, they did make changes. I didn't notice it the first day, but the opening credit scene, they made uh, changes to the, uh, the fight with the Borg. There's now, the, A, the Borg ship has changed to look more like the Borg cube from Picard. I don't know why they did that, uh, because this is still 20 years before Picard, but whatever. I guess they want a more solid, uh, more unified look. So they changed the Borg cube to look like Picard cubes. Uh, but they also added in uh, other alien ships that look to be Packlid ships fighting with the Borg. And they added in Klingon birds of prey with the Romulan warbirds fighting against the Borg. Uh, so that was really cool. And I, I can't believe I missed it the first time. That seems to be the only change they did to the opening credits. So I suspect somehow the Borg and the Packlids are working together uh, to, to try and get this vibranium or whatever it's called. Um, anyway, at, so at the end of the episode, or near the end of the episode, Boimler is stuck on this planet with his away team, and they can't, they're about to be killed by the Packlids. They're trapped in a room. They can't beam out because of a vibranium cloud. And so they're talking about how and why they all joined Starfleet. And, and so Boimler starts talking about all the things that Riker did see on the Enterprise D. And he remembers about um, his clone, his transporter clone. And that gives Boimler an idea. He's like, oh, actually, you know, the cloud that's blocking the transporter is a lot like that atmosphere they had on that planet where his transporter clone was created. And so, obviously, you realize right there and then what's going to happen. Um, Boimler is able to successfully beam out the other three people of his landing party without issue. But then when they go to beam Boimler out, there's a problem. Uh, Riker tells the transporter chief to, to, you know, force it through or something. And so Boimler does finally get beamed up. And of course, two minutes later, the shuttlecraft returns from the surface with Boimler on it. So they cloned, they transporter cloned Boimler. And so Riker is there talking to both Boimlers. He's like, listen, meeting the transporter clone of yourself is never easy. He knows. And uh, he's like, uh, you guys have been so great. I wish I could keep both of you. And... Um, He's like, but Starfleet feels our mission is just too important uh, that uh, we can't have we can't have two of you, uh, you know, identical crew members on the same ship. He's like, so one of you is going to have to return to the Cerritos. And he says, as an ensign, just as like a F you. And, and I know it there makes no logical sense for why you would have to demote. Uh, yeah, it makes sense why you wouldn't want two identical people serving on the same ship, but it makes no logical sense why you have to demote one. But this is comedy, remember. This is primarily a comedy, and as a comedy, it works. The way Riker says, you'll have to be returned to the Cerritos as an ensign. And um, so the two Boimlers look at each other and one steps forward and he says, I'll do it. I'll go back to the Cerritos. And then uh, Riker says, okay, good with me. And the other Boimler says, okay. And then the first Boimler was like, wait, I thought you were going to step forward and say the same thing. And he's like, no, I'm good with what happened. I suspect the uh, Boimler that came forward. Now, we have no way of knowing which one was which, 
I suspect the Boimler that came forward was the original Boimler, the one that came back on the runabout on the uh, shuttlecraft, and that the one that stayed behind was the clone. We'll never know for sure. At least I doubt it. Uh, but um, so it turns out the clone Boimler, he's like uh, he's like yeah. So so uh, he wants to change his name. Instead of uh, instead of keeping Brad, he's like, yeah, you know, Brad's worth's not really working for me, Captain. What do you think about William uh, Boimler? And Riker's like, I like it. He's like, let's have some Romulan ale, and they're they're like best of friends now. Um, so uh, at the very end, now Boimler comes back to the Cerritos, and uh, he basically displaces Jet. Uh, the, the, the crew was just starting the crew, the lower decks, people, uh, Mariner, Tendi and Rutherford, they were just starting to, to accept jet as part of their group until Boimler comes back and everybody wants Boimler and like J poor jet kind of just gets pushed away and he realizes that he's done and he's got to go back to his old team. So Boimler comes in and uh they're like uh oh you've got to go get the drinks because you're the backstabber mariner says are you kidding you backstabbed all of us you're going to be buying all the drinks from now on and boimler you know regretfully uh takes takes on that responsibility and then uh rutherford and tendy have a moment and it's like rutherford's like i think like tendy's like i think he's one of them says you owe me five bucks and like, yeah, or something like that. I don't know if it was dollars, but uh, she's like, yeah, transporter clone called it. And they're like, how how could you call transporter clone is why Boimler would return back to the Cerritos. I thought that was hilarious. Um, it was a lot of good jokes. Okay, so the Klingon, uh, so apparently on the collector's ship, the, the, uh, relic that caused the uh, security system to go off was uh, Tendi first saw it and she's like oh there's all these great things like and she like clears a piece of glass and she looks at something and it's Kales's fornification helmet and so it's this like metal helmet that you know I guess Kales would have worn uh, when he was doing things and um so she doesn't touch it after that she's just like uh -huh, okay whatever uh but the other collector he steals it him stealing it is what causes the security system to go on anyway uh while they're trying to escape uh and then they realize that oh he has the klingon she's like you've got the klingon sex helmet you're the one that caused all this because he was blaming starfleet and he puts it on. He's like, I don't apologize. This is how I got to the top. It's how I'm going to stay on the top. Anyway, he puts on uh, KLS's fornication helmet. And then this uh, giant bones of... Uh, I don't know who it was. I guess it's from a TOS episode. Uh, did somebody become a giant or was it just bones? I'm not sure. But the they were in they were in um, a dinosaur exhibit, but hanging from the ceiling was just a giant TOS uh, blue shirt uniform of bones. So uh, maybe it was just bones. Maybe that was a joke. Uh, McCoy bones. Anyway, so this giant falls onto uh, falls onto the collector, killing him. They're like, well, maybe the helmet saved him. But then the giant skull crushes right where he would have been. So he's dead. Um, anyway, so they've got to, uh, they're trying to get out. Mar There's these things flying around that look like flying Roombas. You know, those, those automatic vacuum cleaners that just go around your house and just Roombas. Uh, and like, they literally look like flying Roombas. And so... Like, what the fuck are these? Flying Roombas? Like, I, like, you know, there's some type of security system. 
So Mariner smacks one away from her. And then, of course, they all turn red. And like, oh, shit, there's some type of network response. And she's like, it doesn't matter. What are they going to do? Suck us to death? And sure enough, they do. They're vacuums. They all try to start sucking on on uh, uh, to people. Like, they're going to suck us to death. So now they have to fight off the Roombas with the giant bones. Mariner and uh, Jet are again fighting to who's got the better plan. Uh, at the end of the day, Mariner and Jet realize that neither of them have the best plan. And they're like, well, we both suck. You know, what we did got us here. Why don't we see what Tendi and Rutherford have to say? And they're like, well, you guys are in charge. They're like, well, well, what would you guys do? And Tendi's like, I don't know. All we've got are these bones. She's like, oh, but remember, Tendi's a, a doctor. But they're these special type of bones, which have a lot of acid in them. And if you rub them, they become acidic. And Rutherford, who's an engineer, says, and we can use that acid to cut through the bulkhead and get to the Jeffries tubes that run the entire length of the ship. He's like, you know, had we done this from the beginning, we never would have had to, had to cross into all these dangerous sections of the ship to begin with. So Mariner and Jed are like, well, why didn't you say something at the beginning? And they're like, well, because you guys were in charge. And so they all realize that they need to get input from everybody. Uh, so they get off the ship uh, in, in escape pods. And um, so meanwhile, Captain Freeman... She is refusing to ask for a status update because she's like, if she asks for a stat, like uh, Commander Ransom's like, you usually ask for three status updates by now. You haven't asked for one. She's like, no, if I ask for a status update, they're going to accuse me of micromanaging. So I'm just going to let this guy, you know, he's a he's an experienced officer. He's going to do it his way. Then they're like, Captain, we're getting escape pods launching from the ship. And so... Uh, she's like, what? Put it on screen. And you see Rutherford and Tendi squeeze into an escape pod meant for one person. And they're like, and she's like, where's uh, uh, Kayshawn? And they pick up this doll. And like, he's right here. And uh, so she's like, yeah, this is the last time I don't micromanage. I don't micromanage. And this is what I get. Uh, so then uh, they cut back to the ship. They put Kayshawn the doll in uh, sick bay, and the cat doctor, Dr. Tana, writes a handwritten note, not a doll, do not play with, uh, and puts it over him on, on a bio bed. Of course, the bird doctor, the bird psychiatrist, comes into sick bay and starts playing with the doll and says, oh, I could use this in my practice to have people tell them, you know, what, what's hurting them or something. And Tana, the cat, gets pissed off and yells at the bird. And it just, the bird-cat dynamic is hilarious to me. And she's like, can't you read whatever? She's like, that's not a toy. And um, the bird and runs out. Um, and, and basically, the episode ends with... Uh, I told you, with Boimler coming back and um, Jet being pushed out of the group. So by the end of the episode, the four main people are back together. Um, it is <clears throat> unclear whether we're going to still follow what happens on the Titan with Boimler's clone. I suspect we will get um, some updates on the pac -led war. Uh, throughout the season, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but, hey, they did it. I didn't think they could. I didn't think they could get Boimler back to the Cerritos without me being wildly upset. But they did. And I gotta say, good job. Honestly, this episode was a solid 9 out of 10. I loved this episode maybe it's just the broken clock that's right twice a day maybe it's a sign of things to come i can only hope uh 
there's no rare, no, not much place they can go, but down. But uh, yeah, this was like this was this one stood out. Thank you, Mike McMahon, and I hope you guys can live up to this in the future. If if this is the future of lower decks, then uh, I'm going to have a really great eight weeks. With that, guys, I hope you enjoyed the review. I hope you watch the episode and enjoy it even half as much as I do. And I'm just going to promise I will tell you it, tell you things like I see them. If they're good, you'll get a good review. And if they're not, believe me, I will hold no punches. Kapla. Oh, and if you would, please... Remember to like, share, subscribe, and do all those things. Uh, it really helps the channel and would help me out a lot. Thanks.